Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to our, our webinar and our series of webinars. Today, we're looking at backup and disaster recovery, uh, the art of business continuity. So what things do we have to worry about and what do we need to think about to make sure that when disaster strikes, uh, the business is able to recover or continue operating and, and come back to something that could stop businesses dead in their tracks. So today on the webinar, we've got uh, myself, Michael, and we've also got Dan from Netitude. Hi there, you all right? <laughs> uh, we're going to be presenting this one together. Yeah. One of the things that we will be looking at is um, ransomware attacks specifically. There's lots of different types of disasters. Um, this is a growing concern and it may even be at the point where we could call it a, a, a grown concern. It's, it's something that everybody needs to be aware of and disaster recovery planning nowadays needs to go beyond fires and floods. If you keep up with the news, you will have heard about Garmin. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's five days offline. Affecting many people as well. Affecting even myself. Okay. <laughs> Five days where I couldn't post the runs in Strava. Uh, Blackboard, less well known name, but some of the clients that it serves uh, National Trust. Okay, yeah. Many universities, many charities didn't stop operations, um, but still very damaging to reputation. And very famously, several years ago, WannaCry NHS, that's probably one of the most well-known viruses out there. And that did cause a huge amount of disruptions. Yeah, I, uh, I remember reading on that. <coughs> Cancelled appointments. So even though they're in a public sector, uh, you can quite easily see that for a business, um, a huge disruption to the, the ability to deliver service. Yeah. It's going to affect reputation, obviously, as well. That's uh, very important with clients being able to deliver. Yeah, it's it's easy to calculate a, a cost of downtime during a disaster based on average wages. Yeah, reputational damage, contractual damage is it's going to go a lot further. It's going to go a lot further. One of the things we'll be exploring is how in IT, we often talk about backups, but just because you have a backup, it does not mean you have a disaster recovery solution. Yeah. And you still have to think about the plan that sits on top of that to make it really work. And obviously also thinking about how to continue through things that are coming up as well at the same time. Absolutely. So depending on the service or the type of technology, um, you're either recovering from a disaster and unable to operate. Mm -hmm. Maybe some things you will be able to keep running whilst you're down. Maybe it's an, an approach rather than a technology solution. Uh, maybe it's telling staff ahead of time that they just need to keep answering the phone and noting things down to update the system later. The communication during these times as well is going to be an important factor to think about. It's very important. It's it's really probably a key thing. Yeah. <laughs> Once you've done the planning, uh, you've got to tell people about it. Yeah. Otherwise, it is, it is not very valuable. Okay, okay. So um, let us know once you're in. Uh, you can do that through the Q&A. If you hover your mouse near the bottom of the screen, near the middle, you get some options pop up. Um, on the bottom right hand corner of our screen at the moment, you can see a little speech bubble in a, in a turquoise circle down there. If you click on those, you can send us questions through and we'll be keeping an eye out and answering them as, uh, as we go. Um, okay, and we also thought we would start with a warm up question to everyone. Uh, so that is, uh, who is most at risk of a ransomware attack? Or who do you think, what industry is uh, most at risk? Uh, and we'll be 
uh, revealing that at the end as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm Dan. Uh, I've been working in the tech industry for the last three years. Uh, I made the move from a development startup into IT a year ago. Uh, my background is based in client relations, uh, but always with an interest in technology, uh, which focuses on efficiency, uh, productivity, and automation. Uh, and I'm Michael. I've been working in IT for the last nine years. I've done various roles, quite hands-on things, moved into account management, and from there I've I've got into the virtual IT director role in, in Netitude. I spend a lot of time talking to businesses about IT and how to make it work for them and um, helping them to build or building IT strategies for them that go from IT basics all the way up to modernizing systems, modernizing processes and, uh, and cloud migrations. Um, for those who aren't Netitude clients, we're a, a managed service provider that's a complete IT department from help desk to project engineers to virtual IT directors. We're based in the Southwest and our, our focus is on making sure our clients achieve business growth for a, a solid IT strategy and a proactive approach to IT. As mentioned before, but yeah, please make sure that you uh, add your questions in the Q&A section and uh, yeah, we'll be addressing those uh, as we go. So the main points that we are going to cover today is business disaster recovery and IT, avoiding a disaster and planning for disaster recovery. So, uh, to start us off, um, when you think of the word disaster, um, what springs to mind specifically? Um, straight away, it's fire, it's flood, acts of God, um, hardware failure is a common one in IT. Cyber breach, growing concern. Um, it's probably not on everyone's radar as much as the other the other ones that mentioned there. But I'd go as far as saying that even something like a snow day could push a business into a disaster uh, if staff can't get to the office. Obviously, we've seen that on a much bigger scale with COVID recently. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so obviously, um, you know, with with disasters, they're going to lead to downtime. Um, why is downtime uh, a major concern for us, um, for any business? Oh, for any business, the, the first question you're going to ask yourself is, can I recover at all? Um, if the answer is, is yes, you've got a way to come back from, from one of these disasters, then the very next thing you're going to be asking is, uh, how long will I be down for? And what are the costs going to be? So we've used this uh, quite simple cost calculator in the background based on number of staff, average annual salary and uh, the profit you'd expect to, to generate within those hours. Okay. So that's going to give a base cost of just under £600 an hour for a business of, of 30 people up here. Um, but really that's that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think yeah. if you've got contractual obligations, uh, the cost of downtime could be much steeper. Mm -hmm. Cost of damaged reputation is really hard to put a, um, a number on. And also just the, the effect on, on clients' businesses, clients rely on you, rely on us, um, and they will also feel the impact if, you, if you're not able to deliver your service during, that, uh, during downtime. Okay. So how often does it happen? I mean, how, you know, how cautious do we have to be? Um, it, it can happen at any time. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's it's incredibly unpredictable. Mm. But the fact is that any of these things can happen to anyone. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily worrying about how likely it is to happen. It is just accepting that of all of these things, sooner or later, it's going to happen to someone and that someone might be you. And so it's just about making sure there is a plan in place because it is just so it could happen. You don't know when, and it is happening constantly to lots of people. As we mentioned earlier on, the news with with Garmin and um, uh, yeah, and especially with the current climate, things have picked up in terms of ransomware. So okay. exactly. Um, so I, I think we can split them into some categories. Some disasters are avoidable. <clears throat> um, Hardware failure from an aging server. If you're working with an MSP, that should be on your radar. It shouldn't be that you know your server accidentally falling over isn't the sort of disaster that 
you should be coming up against normally. Uh, fire and flood, everybody is at risk of it, especially when you share building. If you're running manufacturing, there's there's so many things that can go, go into that. Uh, out of all of the scenarios, the one we're going to focus on most today, however, is, is cyber attack. Uh, as I mentioned, um, it's a it has been a growing concern. I think now we're reaching the point where it's a fully growing concern. You talked about Garmin. They recently had famously front page news, six, five to six days of, of downtime, yeah. unable to provide their service to clients due to a ransomware attack. Um, one of the, the reasons that this is, is growing is because as companies get more cyber insurance, they include ransomware payouts in the insurance. The people that do these attacks then see that it is more likely for them to be e easily able to get payout. Right. Okay. Which unfortunately increases their desire or their, their interest in carrying out these sorts of attacks. Got you. Okay. <clears throat> we um yeah, we got some stats up here just to say that this sort of thing everybody is a target. Yeah. Um some people hit the news, not everybody does, but everybody is a target. It's almost automatic, the process for selecting people. Uh, it affects SMBs almost as much or half of the time, the same as larger enterprises. Um, and one reason to focus on, on this ransomware attack, if, you, if you're not aware of what that means, you get a computer virus, it locks all of your files, and it will display a ransom note, which will say, if you want to get back into your files or use your servers, send us this amount of money by some mechanism. Which is exactly what happened to Garmin. <clears throat> and rumor has it, they actually did end up paying out. So uh, <laughs> there's the cost of recovery as well as possibly having to actually pay people as well. I uh, guess. Absolutely. Which um, should always be avoided. <laughs> Lots of the other scenarios, fire and flood is, you know, it's difficult to deal with, but there's a timeline there. It's about recovering hardware, recovering services. A bit different to being locked out from your systems, from your data, and someone else holding holding the key to that. Um, we've touched on these, these three already, actually, in the news. Um, one of the things we've seen is if you're a larger company, enterprise level, uh, it's kind of a national brand name, you may well hit the news that it happens to you. Just because smaller companies aren't in the news, it doesn't mean it isn't happening. Um, see, cyber reaches and those, it's not as widely reported, but for sure your clients, your suppliers, you yourself are, are going to notice this if it's happening. So I think where, it, where it's happening to smaller companies, um, it is news within your stakeholders. Yeah. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so, why do we hear about um, you know we, we hear about backup, uh, disaster recovery, and business continuity together? I mean, are they are they just the same thing, or are they are they different? They're really very related. Okay, but they are different. We do have to think about different things when we're talking about them. So yeah, we'll we'll run through quickly where we see the difference being yeah, most relevant for IT uh, and for you understanding what's going on. So a backup in this scenario is just a copy of files, a copy of your data somewhere else. Does it exist somewhere else, or do you literally have all your eggs in one basket? Okay. However, a backup in its own doesn't mean that it's a good backup. It could just be a copy of your files on a USB drive hanging out the back of the server. Okay. So fire and flood, it's definitely not going to protect the business in that in, in that in that sense. So we'd often use a backup tool to set up a, a sort of disaster recovery solution. And that's going to look a bit more like this. Rather than just copying files to USB drive, we're going to take a whole copy of everything in the server. We're going to copy it to the NAS, mm -hmm. a NAS normally or another server. And importantly, it's going to be backed up off site. An off site could be a branch office, preferably the cloud, the secure data center. So, in that sense, you know the web happens to your premises, 
you've got a copy of the data there. When you add the disaster recovery planning into it, then you're going to start asking questions like, how fast should this happen? How often should I back up? Um, in this example, when you're just running a backup, you're not really too concerned about asking these questions. It's once a week, could be. Um, half an hour is more appropriate. A backup every half an hour uh, is more appropriate for most people. Once you really get into disaster recovery planning, you talk about these sorts of timings and start asking the questions about how quick should things happen. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is for certain services, they need to be up and running as soon as possible. That's when we'd look at creating a business continuity solution. So in, in, at least in terms of IT, it's business continuity if it can fail and you barely notice or you're back up and running within a very short period of time, operations aren't affected. You continue to run the business despite the, the failure. So, that, so business continuity is about avoiding any downtime, whereas disaster recovery is bouncing back in the background kind of thing. Yeah, business continuity is much more automatic. It is something that happens very quickly. It might be a blip, but it isn't a noticeable chunk of, it's not a stoppage. Okay. If you're in a disaster scenario, I would say that is when it is a stoppage and you're doing manual work or IT is doing manual work to get you back up and running and there is noticeable downside. So we've covered the basics of what disaster recovery is. Um, so I suppose really we should move on to how to avoid being in the situation at all. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, what, what can businesses do? What can we do to avoid ever getting into this situation in the first place? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the easiest way to reduce downtime is to avoid having downtime in the first place. Uh, there's a couple of obvious things that should be covered that you should be thought about. Um, specifically in our scenario, so cyber breach, ransomware, you're locked out from your files, how do you stop that from happening? Um, well, nowadays, really, the RMSP service, we're targeting a, a baseline of security. So, um, the, the obvious things to the government backed cyber essential standards, it's a, um, a baseline of security. The growing threats ransomware that we see today really does require additional layers of protection, more advanced software, systems hardening, uh, monitoring and planning on how to uh, respond to anything like this. So, Seriously considering additional security, cybersecurity services, I think nowadays is something that should be on everybody's radar, if not part of their strategy to, to implement already. Okay. Really key part of that is, is training. Um, we've seen the industry reports and what you see is a graph of IT investment and software and hardware spending on security devices going like this. Yep. The training is actually just going along. Plateaued. Plateaued. Okay. And I suppose the human element is going to be the most important all the time because it's humans that are always interacting with the technology. So it's interesting that we haven't put so much investment there over time. Um, yeah, and actually, the more you invest in, in software, the, without investing in training, the human element is the, the easier bit to target. So that will still be I mean, it drives the focus onto humans, you know, phishing emails, those kind of things. And it is honestly difficult to uh, keep up with uh, the latest sorts of threats on and, and a personal level without doing ongoing training. So um, training is one of the main parts of our cybersecurity service. Mm -hmm. And I think without it, it wouldn't be complete. No. Um, Staff need to be aware, the training needs to be ongoing. Um, the kind of things we do is send out test phishing emails. If somebody happens to click on it, straight away you're alerted and told this is the things that you should have looked out for. Next time, be careful. And uh, here's a link to some training to go off and do uh, to heighten your awareness. Mm, perfect, so it's really addressing the, the sort of the weak link there in terms of helping people keep themselves safe 
Exactly. It's uh, it's much easier or much straightforward to put the software in place to provide as much protection as possible. Doing that ongoing training is 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 more difficult. It's more challenging to do, uh, but we do have a way to do that. Uh, you can track training over time. You can see uh, which individuals need extra training. You can see areas of weakness across the whole business, and we can help provide targeted training to really tighten up that area. Perfect. So. Um, other things, so proactive maintenance is a big one. Uh, this is one of the sources of avoidable failure. Um, software updates, um, fixing backup failures, all of the things that you'd expect a standard MSP service to include. Okay, and that would all fall within managed systems and make sure that all antivirus and things are up to date as well. Absolutely. Operating systems. Um, use of the cloud is a big one. It's, you know, many people are moving to it because it has a lot of business continuity options built straight in out of the box. If you're still looking at a server on site, uh, you can have a backup server. It's a really good solution. Many of the cloud solutions, popular one being Microsoft's Office 365 for email. You don't see it, but in the background, um, you've got free servers running your emails in one data center. You've got another free servers in another data center. And that kind of scale and automatic failover is just not something that is very easy to replicate for most small to medium businesses. Um, however, cloud doesn't always include disaster recovery. Okay, so <laughs> one to watch out for and, and always make sure that there's a disaster recovery solution uh, there in the background. Uh, the final one I would think about is just hardware refresh. Okay. IT still relies on hardware, even if you're in the cloud. We shouldn't let equipment get old. Failure rates peak after five years, seven years, depending on the exact hardware. Um, it's a, a big source of avoidable downtime. And okay, so let's say we've got the ideal setup with, you know, we're adhering to all of these, but surely there's still a risk in terms of disaster recovery? Yeah, um, when you're looking at disaster recovery plan, you see the items that you have or the services that you have, you look at what the mitigations could be, you apply them, and it's it's an ongoing process. So yeah. you will come back and say, well, what now? There's still going to be disasters, uh, some sort of unforeseen circumstance. Mm -hmm. And so even with all the best preventative measures in place, yeah, we still need to have disaster recovery plan. The business still needs to have that plan in place. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, what if the worst happens? <laughs> Planning for a disaster. So, what does a business need to think about um, if they end up in a backup and disaster recovery situation? Yeah. Um, so, we're going to illustrate this one because it's a bit easier. Um, we're going to focus on the IT side, but we will touch on, on, on the business side as well. Okay. Uh, so a business has a, a disaster recovery plan. IT has a lot to input and has a lot of explaining to help you understand exactly what's going on in the background. Um, and that process will look something like picking a specific service like emails, mm -hmm. this could be files, it could be your most important application, it could be a less important application, um, but it's terming it in something that makes sense to the business. So we're not talking about server free is gonna go down, what do you do? You say email is going to go down, you're not going to get be able to communicate with your clients, you're not going to be able to communicate with other stuff. So what does that, what does that look like? Uh, the sort of things, the sort of inputs we'd provide for your disaster recovery plan uh, is the time to recover. So email's gone down, how long do we expect that it would take to get back up? That will allow the business to start to question what it would look like for them, uh, what they need to do in that time. Uh, we would look at how much work is going to be lost uh, because backups run periodically there is always going to be some sort of a window. Five, even if it's small as five minutes or one minute or half an hour or an hour, 
where work might be lost. Uh, we need to highlight how much to expect of that and also how far back things go in general. So, do you know, do you only go back a week? Do you go back 30 days? What happens if I delete something? That's the smallest disaster I can imagine is deleting a really important file. Yeah. Um, but if your backups only go seven days and you notice on week two, it's it's uh, too late, a personal level disaster. OK. <laughs> Once we've documented these sort of timings, it is a conversation with the client, with the business to say, well, this is what we are expecting to happen right now. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. The, the, the answer to that will be fed back in. Backup doesn't go far enough. Uh, it doesn't get us up and running fast enough. We can't be without email for four hours. Um, and then we'll offer a list of mitigations or ways to reduce that time, reduce the impact, update the plan and, and continue to iterate like that. OK, so constant improvement, even on a plan that's been laid out, always testing and always improving. And as business as businesses grow as well, their needs will change as well. Yeah, it, it's a constant process because needs change, um, options change and um, just running through the process of talking about how long things will take to recover will often bring up interesting questions. Okay. The process itself is, is, is key to, to learning more and thinking about more possibilities. Cool. It's going to sit inside a, a larger plan. Um, so those are the sorts of IT inputs. On the business side, I'd expect that to be slotting into these sorts of things. So a business should identify who, what their key roles are, uh, which staff are doing the most important jobs. That's going to help prioritise when the disaster happens, who to get up running faster um, and how to best support them. Equipment is an obvious one. IT will have some input in that. So asset list, this is how many computers you have, this is how many monitors you have, this is the expected Replacement cost, a business itself is going to have other things, desks, maybe telephone systems, stationery, all these things that people need to be able to do their job. IT is only a subset of that. Premises, where are you going to go if it's a fire, if it's a flood? Again, IT can have some input in that. If you've got a second office, what do you need to add to scale it up to take on more staff? Uh, what do staff need to be able to have to work from home and um, or if it's a service office that's a popular backup option how fast an internet connection should you be asking for okay how many desks do you need to ask for do you need space in the comms room uh, insurance uh, you know the business should have insurance that covers these sorts of disasters you need to know based on the equipment list how much how to access any payouts if, if it's going to take time to process an insurance requirement, is there, what's the budget? What's the cash flow sort of considerations there? What do you need to have on the side to be able to, to handle a uh, disaster and get equipment in place? And finally, we said it right at the beginning, communication is going to be key. Once we've gone through this whole process, once IT is fed into the business's disaster recovery plan, who do you speak to? Um, just getting the message out there. Get the message out there. Who's your key IT, IT contacts? Who are your key insurance contacts? Mm -hmm. Who are your key? Um, how do you communicate it to staff? When do you communicate it to clients? Um, all those sorts of considerations. So each plan is absolutely going to be unique to each business. And also, as we touched on before, develop as each business grows as well. So constantly changing thing, always adapting to the current situation uh, and also the situation in terms of how they are as a business as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we provide a, a base disaster recovery solution. Um, on When surveyed, most small and medium businesses said that four hours to recover was an acceptable amount of downtime. So that's the sort of thing we target as a, as a standard to begin with. 
Um, and certainly the, the backup software that we use, the storage that we use for the backups, uh, the cloud backups, it all, at least to begin with, focuses on this, this four hour window being a sort of expectation. If you don't know where else to start, yeah. four hours to get back up and running is reasonable. Most people consider it. And then you adjust up and down from there. Yeah, you target what's what's important, what you can't make do without, and you build on top of that. So uh, if you if you need to go for less than four hours and you're still very server based, you'd expect to see a, a backup server, the same as the, the main server. You're copying things across every five minutes. And if the server, if your main server goes off, the other one pops back on, you're up and running. And it's like for like as well. So we fix, you'd fix the failed one in the background and you set it back up as um, as the main server. Okay. Sorry, as, as the backup, as the new backup server. So you have a, the disaster hub, if failure happens, you're up and running on the backup server within a very short period of time. Um, and then you continue operating and, we, and everything gets sorted out in the background. Okay. Some One thing to consider is uh, failing to the cloud or failing to uh, a less than like for like server, even though it's a you know less investment required up front, there's more downtime because you still have to get back to normal once the disaster is finished. Okay, okay. So if a business has great IT in place and everything, uh, uh, you know, you've got, you've got all the things that we've talked about, is everything just automatically taken care of? <laughs> Do you need to not worry? <laughs> um, I, I think you still need to be aware um, because IT is just part of the of the larger businesses disaster recovery plan and business continuity planning. So um, certainly with the solutions that we do for backup, whether you're in the cloud or whether you're in the server, we're taking care of a lot of the basics. Uh, but no, you still need to be engaged on what it is you're expecting from the system. This is where our quarterly review process comes into it. It focuses IT on the business needs and checking that IT is still meeting changing business needs. Mm. It allows time to discuss adjustments um, and, and implement them. Excellent. Um, cool, okay. So, we asked a question at the beginning and it was uh, about which industry was most at risk um, or which industry you thought was most at risk from a uh, ransomware attack. Um, so we haven't had any uh, suggestions to that. So I don't know if you guys want to pop a few suggestions in the Q&A box. We'll just have a quick look. See if if you want to. <laughs> So I would be thinking about um, the different uh, industries would be leisure, uh, media and entertainment or um, public services, um, finance, manufacturing, um, that's we'll go. transport as well. Okay, got a few suggestions coming through. Good. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much for those. So the answer actually is, and this surprised me actually when I was looking, I honestly thought it would be the public sector or finance. Uh, they seem the sort of most obvious ones to go for, but it is in fact media, leisure and the entertainment industry. So quite, quite interesting. Uh, hey. that of all the industries. It is quite a in wide industry yeah. <laughs> grouping, I'd say. Uh, things that they do have, I mean, everybody's data is very valuable, but, um, you know, you have a lot of photos, videos, that sort of things. In, in media, it's very valuable. Once you're locked out from it, yeah. you're going to need to pay to get it back. Um, I suppose all, all of the clients or, or customers' data is also points toward um, their interests as well, which which is the kind of uh, data that's very, yeah, as you said before, valuable. So 
I suppose that makes sense there. There may be some trend in investment in IT in, in those industries. They may potentially be un under investing, makes them an easier target. Um, yeah. Um, cool. OK, so we've sort of come toward the end. Um, on our sign up uh, form, we did uh, leave a space for people to ask some questions. Uh, we got a couple through. So the first question was, uh, how long is normal recovery time? Uh, I think we did touch on this one um, and it was sort of you're looking at about four, hour, four hours, so half a business day, uh, depending on the business. Um, and another one was, uh, do I need a plan if I'm in the cloud, which is a really great question. It is. Uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things where uh, because the cloud is a sort of fluffy concept, it's <laughs> quite a wide category of, of, all, of all sorts of things. People hear cloud and they assume that once you're in the cloud, disaster recovery is taken care of or backup is taken care of. And and that is that is simply not the case. Okay, but it is lowest level. The cloud is is just more servers in a different building. It might be a very good building, a data center. Um, but in some previous cloud outages, people have been surprised to find that they they do not have a backup in a different cloud. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's it's a really important item to consider. The cloud is fantastic in most implementations for business continuity. It can automatically fail over very quickly. Almost no noticeable disruption. However, something like a, a crypto locker virus, the ransomware that we've been talking about during this webinar, what you end up with a very good business continuity solution is that your locked files are very quickly copied Therefore, business continuity isn't the sort right, sort right, right sort of solution to, to come back from that. Okay. One is a disaster recovery solution, so that is your files, your data in a different place, completely separate, that can be recovered from. Okay. Excellent. Um, cool. Uh, oh, we have another one here. Um, how safe from, oh yeah, so how safe are we from cyber attack in the cloud? So I suppose uh, specifically looking at people targeting the cloud itself and files within there, do you? Yeah, that's, um, that is a, that is a really good question as well. And it's where people are looking at going from service to the cloud. It's, it's a common question. There's a feeling that uh, it's out of your hands, it's a bigger target, but the security practices in place are beyond what is achievable, uh, I think, for most small, medium businesses, even with the best protections in place. Mm. It's, you know, with the big services, Office 365 for email and files, definitely there's absolute separation from between tenants. If you have a backup in place, then you know you're covered. Yeah. And actually, the biggest risk at the moment, I think, for, for cloud is it, it's still your user accounts rather than the cloud service itself. So this is why we're talking to a lot of people right now about multi-factor authentication. Okay. When you go to log into your cloud service, you get a code on your phone, and you have to put that in. Uh, it stops a lot of cybersecurity breaches in its tracks. Mm. Um, you'd expect any good cloud providers to be running antivirus and everything that's coming in and out of the, their cloud and on the services. Um, if you're looking at third party cloud providers, not third party, but outside of Office 365, outside of the big ones, if it's your specific CRM, customer relationship management application or your line of business application, whatever it is that you're using, um, it is well worth asking questions about security. Um, a lot of providers have had to adjust very rapidly to the cloud. Uh, you know, they've spent years developing software to run on a server in the corner of the office. All of a sudden, everybody's got a cloud option. They feel like they should have a cloud option, but their expertise has been in programming for servers, not programming for the cloud. I'd definitely be looking for a statement on security, what practices they have in place. 
um, when comparing uh, their services. Okay. So on that same subject, we just had another question. Yeah. Um, so if uh, if somebody uses OneDrive uh, for all their files, and they so there's obviously duplicate one in the cloud, one yeah. on your laptop as well. And if the laptop was compromised in some way, however that is, whether it's ransomware or just a virus, um, and the files are encrypted, you know, um, would OneDrive files be able to would they, would the OneDrive files get encrypted inside the cloud, or or is there sort of a shelf period there, or is there is this sort of a combination of the two happening? Um, it's, it's a really good example of the cloud and, and business continuity. So in a, in a normal disaster, a, a personal level, you've dropped your laptop, uh, it didn't like it, and you're worrying about getting access to your files. Luckily, you've got them in OneDrive, so you log in for a web browser or you get a new laptop and it just downloads them straight back and you know that you've got fairly recent versions of it, probably within the last five minutes, if not, you know, real time, the, the latest thing you've you've done with it. Fantastic for that. CryptoLocker, um, your files are getting locked. They may get copied, locked into the cloud. Okay. So in that case, this is where you have to ask yourself whether your cloud solution has disaster recovery built in. And the answer with Office 365 is no, not really. Okay. We need a separate backup solution. The one that we use securely takes a copy of all the files you're creating and stores it in, in actually Amazon Web Services, the, one of the biggest cloud providers. Uh, if your files were to get locked in OneDrive, um, you would recover it from this other service. Okay, so even so, using a single cloud. Uh, is great for your sort of yeah your hardware failure. That's what it's really built against. Uh, but yeah, in terms of being uh, all your files being encrypted, you would still be looking to find a backup in another location. Anyway, so having those different backups in one or two separate places is a lot like very very much more important in that sense. Yeah, it's the ever since tape backups. Uh, the idea is to have three copies, mm -hmm. two different mediums yeah. so on the server itself or on, on a different server and at least one of them off-site so that still applies to the cloud the off-site bit is not covered until you're in another cloud or copied off at least uh, in that sense mm. okay. um, what i wouldn't expect when the cloud security comes into it is you wouldn't expect the virus to go into the cloud and then start to encrypt so it would just purely be the files themselves that would get encrypted and then just... Yeah, and OneDrive would be doing its its job if it's copying files as changes are made to them. Okay. So it's, yeah. Hopefully, you know, if you, you know, managed antivirus, the additional sorts of protections we talked about for advanced cybersecurity, um, you would have protection against the majority of, of ransomware viruses. Certainly with the advanced security tools, yeah. Um, they look out for the sort of things that ransomware does. Yeah. You know, it's not normal computer usage to go around locking all your files. Uh, it can see that, it can stop in its tracks, it can alert IT. Okay. Um, and hopefully with the user training thing, you're not accidentally clicking on links. You're more aware. You're thinking about these things. You're thinking before you click. It's at the front of your mind and it's not likely to get on. But yes, even then, there might be a very new, very potent virus and you still need that disaster recovery solution there if, okay. if the worst happens. So uh, another question was, can you stop the ransomware spreading to the backups? Uh, I suppose we sort of half covered that. It's you, yeah, in some cases you can't. Uh, in which case it's important to have that second fallback. Yeah, <laughs> so we talked about it for the cloud, but with the server, um, the way our backup solution normally works is that you take a copy of the server every half an hour to a, a NAS box. So that's a, a resilient bit of storage, better than a USB drive, but it is sharing the network. Potentially it's at risk if something already is, is already in the network, it's at risk of also being locked. However, our offsite backups to our data center, uh, it's done by a mechanism where 
the virus can't make the jump over to the, the, to the data center, it can't start locking backup images, you're definitely gonna, gonna have something to be able to come back from there. Okay. Um, and that's all we had in terms of questions for now. Yeah, cool, excellent. Thank you very much for those. That's great. Um, we, uh, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions afterwards, um, you know, feel free to contact either myself or Michael. Um, if you have anything specific to do with your business that you perhaps have questions about, uh, we'd be happy to uh, help out with those. I'm sure. We'll be sending a follow-up email as well, so uh, you can respond to that and we'll make sure it gets through to the right person to be able to take a look on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah.